Please welcome tonight's guest moderator from Beatle Fan Magazine, Beatle Brunch Radio, and the Fest for Beatle Fans, Tom Frangione, the film's director, Ryan White, and Frida Kelly. Welcome, Frida. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the <laughs> Apple Theater. So, Frida, here we are, 40 years later, and you're working the room at Apple again. <laughs> no, no? I'm sorry, I couldn't... It's changed I, I a bit, hasn't it? It's changed it, a know, bit from, yeah. uh, from the last time you were in a place called Apple, I bet. Um, this is a wonderful new film. Some of you may have seen it last night at the Museum of Moving Images. Anyone? A bunch of you, right? It was terrific. Um, for those that haven't seen it, it will be available beginning tomorrow on iTunes uh, for rent. And appearing at the Sunshine uh, Cinema down here on, I think, 13th Street here in Soho. Uh, excuse me? Houston Street, thank you. Uh, beginning next Friday, the 13th. It'll be a good luck, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> it's a wonderful film. For those of you that uh, have heard only a little bit about it, um, we have Frida here to, uh, to tell us a little bit more about not just the film, but about her days at the Beatles fan club. Um, Frida, for those who may not be familiar with where the title of the film came from, good old Frida, share that story, please. Right. The title came from a fan club record. Um, what it was, the Beatles had decided um, to give the fans a record that they made specially for them for Christmas. And then I found out that they'd mentioned me in it, and I was a bit on edge until I heard it, because you never know with them. And... On the record, George thanks me, and then John shouts, good old Frida, and then the others join in. So that's how we got the title. Wow. Uh, how many folks out there have heard those Beatles fan club records, the Christmas records, right? A bunch of people have heard those. Those are, those are highly prized collectibles yeah. at this point. And actually what we've done is roped you in here tonight to try and talk to the folks at iTunes to maybe see if those could be made available. Would you guys <laughs> like that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. Um, and as, as Frida said, those were a direct product of the fan club and just yeah, for the fans. To, yeah. You have to be a member of the fan club to get one of those records. Right. And how, how did who, whose idea was it? Was that for, through the press office or the, yes. the band? Yeah. Or? No, it was through the press office. Um, Tony mentioned it to them and they were very, very willing to do it. So they'd, over a period of six, seven years, they, they'd done one each year. And then when the fan club packed up, uh, as a leaving present, we put them all on one and gave that out as an LP, right. as a goodbye present. Right, a very highly prized collectible among the, the Beatle fans out there. And then you mentioned Tony, that was Tony Barrow? Tony Barrow Tony was Barrow. the press officer then. Right, yeah. okay. And w these were sent out, you had to be in the fan club, you had as to you be said. A, you had to be a member, yeah. So at, at its peak, how many of those were you sending out? Well, at the peak, it, there was about 40,000 members. Wow. 40,000 copies of that going out. You imagine so that? They're, they're somewhere around. In yeah, the world. they're somewhere around somewhere. Yeah, um, that's, that's a, a fantastic story. And I always felt that those records, while people thought of them as these novelty things of the Beals telling jokes and skits, you can really hear how they evolve. Uh, over yeah, the years they, in the beginning, each one changes, happy. doesn't it? Yeah, yeah ends up really like a do. pantomime. And, right, they get they get really creative and psychedelic yeah. in the middle, and by the end, you can sense that they're, they're recorded. They're getting fed up. Yeah, that they're in four <laughs> different rooms, right. Um, in your role as the fan club secretary, uh, as we see in the film, you, you take on more than a, a secretary job. It was long before the days of you know, certainly email and, and internet and, and instant communication. Um, you, you seem to have taken on a role of confidant to them, and more than that, a link to their families in Liverpool. There's some great, great footage and photographs in the movie of you with them at holiday dinners and birthday parties. And, yeah. and tell us, what was, what was that like, you know, being the link to their, to their families in Liverpool? Well, uh, of course, I would get the information where they were playing, and um, also I was typing contracts, so I knew what was penciled in in the diary. So when I went to the parents' houses, which I did on a regular basis, I would tell them, you know, where they were going to, be playing or what was coming up and also they were always asking me for photographs because oh. people asked them for photographs but so I was the link you know sometimes I saw the Beatles more than they did because I would go to London and then I'd, I'd get my information down when I was down in London from the press office and then I would bring that back up um, to Liverpool to the parents. Wow um, as we said before that sounds kind of like a job that 
probably millions and millions of people, certainly young girls, would have loved to have had back in the 60s. Uh, but I would dare say, after seeing the film, precious few could have done it as faithfully and as with such grace as you did. Oh, thank um, you. I'd like to go to our first clip, Rick, uh, talking about is a, some clips here of Frida from the movie talking about that dream job. Wasn't so, I a lucky girl? Yeah. That, yeah, looking great. Um, and actually, you started, um, as, as we heard there, actually before we kind of knew the Beatles as we know them, John, Paul, George, and Ringo, Pete was still in the band when you were uh, working for Brian and this idea of the fan club came up. Is that right? Uh, no, I was helping out with the fan club because I didn't start the fan club. Another girl started okay. it. But I did help Bobby when mm -hmm. Pete was in the group. Okay. And then I went to work for Brian, and then Richie joined very soon. Oh, very. You had nothing to do with that, I hope. No. No. Okay. No. no. Um, but <laughs> Are you as, trying to trip me up? No. No, by no means. Um, <laughs> what we as Beatle fans have heard so many stories over the years about how popular Pete was, um, and that he was a fan favorite. And did that did that cause any kind of a uh, a bubbling among the fans when that happened? Did you did you get to bear the brunt of any of that or? Just a little bit. Just I mean, little. he was very popular and he was okay. very good looking, you know. Um, and, of course, Richie had his following as well. So, it, you know, it died down in, in a matter of weeks. Um, Frida, in the film, it's, it, it comes across far, you know, far to the front of just how big a fan you were of theirs, just as, as, as we all are, right? Um, I was wondering if you could tell us, as a fan... We've been waiting 40 years to hear this story, and we can talk with Ryan more about how the film came together. Why, why was this the right time uh, to bring this story out? Well, over the years, you know, when I did pack up, um, I had a few offers. You know, people wanted me to do books and, you know, things like that, but I didn't really want to do it. I just wanted to lie low. But when my grandson came along, um, I thought, well, I'd like him to know what is Granny done in her youth, you know? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I think Niall coming along gave me that push to come on, get your act together and do something. <laughs> that's so the timing was right, really. That's great. Um, and over, over the years, in, in that span of time, um, without necessarily offers of a film or a book, did people, did people ask you, gee, what, what was that like? Were you, could, could you view this like we all do and, and love the music and love it without, without it being too entwined in your, in your career and your backstory? No, I mean, when I packed up, I didn't really talk about it. And of course, I had a different name and I moved, so nobody knew what I had done at all. So there wasn't many people did ask me. I see. Well, I before, managed to get out of it. <laughs> before we uh, talk with Ryan about some of how the film actually came together, I'd like to go to our second clip, uh, where I think you can really see uh, the twinkle in our special guest's eye about how big a Beatle fan she is. Rick, if you would play clip two. That's great. So you see, you're not... You're pass. Not, yeah, the pass. <laughs> You're, you're not so different from a lot of people, I imagine, where a favorite Beatle changes from day to day <laughs> on so many fiddle. levels. <laughs> Ryan, as director of the film, congratulations first on this, this wonderful, wonderful Thank bit you. of film on behalf of Beatle fans everywhere uh, for all you did for this. Um, I wanted to, to ask you a, a question about pulling it all together. Um, you know, much had been made earlier this year about a, a TV show, a very popular TV show called Mad Men that they, oh my God, got the rights to use an original Beatle recording in a movie. Oh my God, and they paid a king's ransom. There's Beatle music, original versions peppered throughout this whole thing. Tell us how you were able to quarterback that, and were the folks at Apple, not, not our Apple here, but at Apple uh, Beatle World, uh, were they receptive to the idea of use of the original recordings in the film? Yeah, it's actually funny you use the Mad Men example because the day we had our first meeting with Apple Records about our film, my producer Kathy McCabe and I were in a coffee shop waiting to go into Apple, and the New York Times published that article about how Mad Men was the first television show to ever pull off 
a Beatles song, and and they had used a snippet of Tomorrow Never Knows, which, as we know, isn't even a huge Beatles hit, and they paid $250,000 for that portion of the song. And so that was as we were walking up into Apple, and we were thinking, God, that's like seven times our budget for the entire film. <laughs> yeah, for a 10-second uh, clip. <laughs> right. So we were extremely intimidated. And, and, and from the very beginning of the film, people told us, you know, it's impossible to license Beatles songs. You won't be able to pull it off. But we thought... You know, at least we have to go through the process. We got, we at least have to get the rejection. We're not going to throw the towel in. Uh, and I have to say, it's a total testament to Frida. I think that we pulled it off. Uh, the fact that I was even able to get in those doors and have the phone calls with, I mean, it is a lot of people who take place in the ownership of Beatles music. It's not just Apple Records. It's also many record labels, many people who own the publishing, and they all have to say yes for you to pull it off. And I think that's why it's so rare in film and television still, is because typically somewhere along the road someone says no and, and those those filmmakers are stopped in their tracks and so I think I was probably the luckiest Beatles filmmaker who ever existed that I could begin in my leading line on these phone calls or going into a meeting saying my movie was about Frida Kelly uh, this woman who had worked for the Beatles as one of their longest serving employees you know never sold them out never cashed in is still a working secretary today in Liverpool for a law firm and it's just really a sweet endearing film and Time after time, we got yeses, and it took two years, but we pulled it off right before our world premiere in March. Wow, that's a great, great, great story, and as you say, testament to, to uh, yeah, absolutely, you know, to the uh, affection they still had. Um, were the surviving directors uh, of the Beatles, Paul and Ringo, and uh, to you know, by extension, Yoko and Olivia, did they ask to see the film? Did they ask uh, for? you know, to see a draft of it to kind of get yeah, I mean, the it is essence a very, of it. very thorough process. And so that involved, you know, I, I don't know if they watched the film, but I know that there was opportunities for, to watch, for them not only to watch the film, but read scripts. And so it was extremely thorough where a lot of people in Apple Records were involved, including, including the board. So I don't think they would have, I mean, they, I, they know Frida very well. I think they knew that she would never uh, make a film that undermined them in any way, but they don't know me and they don't, you know, they don't know the company that I was making this with. And so I think they needed to see things that, that put those nerves to rest. But uh, once, once they saw the film, it was, it was a lot of support that we've had. We've been very, very lucky in that regard. Great. And the film um, had a lot of backing. I imagine some people, maybe even here in our audience, might see their names in the credits. Um, through the Kickstarter campaign, which was, uh, I think, I, when I saw how many people got behind this, I think it really spoke to just how, how you know, beloved this film would be for Beatle fans. Yeah, I mean, originally this wasn't even supposed to be a movie. Originally, Frida asked me to... I know Frida from way back. My uncle is actually Billy Kinsley from the Mersey Beats, who's in the film. So oh, we go okay. way back. I've known her for many decades. Um, and originally, the idea was, I did not know she was the Beatles secretary, though, my whole life. I did not know that until a few years ago when she approached me about doing this for her family. And the original idea was just to create a little DVD that she could give to her family that recorded her stories. Um, and I, you know, when I heard she was the Beatles secretary, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know if that meant she worked for them, you know, for a year, or if she was one of, you know, 20 secretaries. So uh, my mind was blown when I found out she was the Beatles secretary, but then my mind was really blown when I started talking to other people and I learned, you know, the, the, the length of her tenure for the Beatles and the scope uh, and importance with which she served them. And so then the, the, the wheels started turning, and, and I thought this, this would make a really great story as a, as a film, and not just a family film, not sure. that there's anything wrong with that, no, but, a, but a film for a lot more people to see. And so um, that started about three years ago, and here we are now. And we all thank you for, for taking that to the next level yeah. and, and having that vision. Um, before we come back and talk with Frida again about uh, some great fan club uh, stories and to get questions from you all here in our audience, I'd like to see uh, our, our last clip um, which kind of will give you just a, an idea of how, how personal uh, this, this was an endeavor for Frida. As, as we hear in the film, as that, that clip goes on, Frida's dad's worried about where the electric bill is in, in that big pile of mail. Um, <laughs> while we talk about Apple, Frida, um, tell us, how did working um, and, and managing the fan club change when the Beatles formed their own organization, Apple, and moved uh, headquarters to London. How did that, that change you know, how you had to uh, manage the club? Well, I didn't go to London, and it gives the reason why in the film. Um, so I just stayed in Liverpool. But I did go to Apple on a regular basis. You know, I was in, 
an employee of Apple. Right. Um, so I used to go down about every six weeks and, you know, say a day or two. Okay, and that's where the press office was? Is that the press now? office was... And by yeah. then it was Derek Taylor? It was Derek, right? okay. yeah. Derek was a lovely man. Yeah. You know, full of fun and, you know, I ne Derek always had a big smile on his face. Yeah. <laughs> There's, you know, to this day, there's a, a mystique that surrounds Apple. There have been books written about it, about how chaotic it was and how idyllic it was. Um, and there's actually, uh, while we're here uh, doing an installment of Meet the Filmmaker, uh, some folks may have heard there's actually a movie in production. Uh, Liam Gallagher from Oasis uh, is, is heading that up to talk about um, you know, what Apple was like. Um, so I guess the, the two questions I have about that is one, has anyone from that side reached out to you to get any input? From Apple, uh, from... From this second film? No. No? No, I haven't heard from anybody over this. Well, the second question is, who do you think should play you in the film? <laughs> <laughs> Marilyn Monroe. There you go, okay, <laughs> of course. Um, I think we're about ready to go out to the crowd. Is that right? Uh, for some questions and answers. If you have a question you'd like to ask Frida or Ryan, please raise your hand. Uh, we'll get a microphone over to you, and you can be part of our podcast. Hi, Frida. Lou. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you, I don't know if you're allowed to talk about this, but I remember being a kid and listening to Beatle albums backwards to find out if Paul was really dead or alive <laughs> and getting really freaked out. Do you, can you elaborate on it, collaborate on it at all as far as, was that like a big um, publicity thing to make people crazy? It was a publicity thing to, to pretend that Paul was was dead no 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 i don't know who started it but um you know i tell you what it was a nightmare in the office because we were getting phone calls all the time and it got so bad i would just pick it up and put the phone down you know <laughs> just to try and get some work done because i was trying to convince them that hello i saw him the night before but it got to the point where they weren't even believing me you know if you can't believe Frida Kelly, who can you believe? I got to ask that question. Thank you, Lou. That's a good question. Um, we have somebody here in the front row. In the film yesterday, uh, I noticed how, as you were saying, you know, you'd get these pillowcases to ask Richie's mother to have him sleep on it and so forth. And I think that probably changed over time, right? towards the 68 let's yeah. say you weren't going to be getting that kind of thing and no. you know perhaps the mail was changing and I was wondering uh, if you could sort of elaborate on that as to how it evolved through the 60s and what were you getting towards the end of the time the middle of the time etc yeah well I mean the members naturally grew with us through the years and towards the end, uh, I couldn't even answer the questions because it was all about the music and what they were doing in the recording studios and, you know, what guitar they were playing. And it was all, like, technical to me. So I used to have to take those lessons to London. And when I saw them, or I would even ask Peter Brown or Neil Aspinall what those questions were. But, um, you know, I would go back then and type the lessons and I came quite knowledgeable. <laughs> Wow. On that side. That's a great question. Thank you for that. Uh, other questions? We, we have another in the front row. Oh, wait. We're in the back. Where are we? Okay. On this side. Hi, Frida. Hi. I absolutely loved your documentary, and I am so jealous. That's what I want to say. <laughs> uh, but I noticed at the Thank end, uh, Ringo did comment, and uh, I kind of was expecting Paul. Was he asked to comment on the... We didn't ask Paul. Paul was busy at the time oh. anyway, you know, and, but I was just so excited that they gave me the records. Oh. I was very thankful for that. Okay. Well, it was, it's wonderful. Very much enjoyed it. Thank you. Great, thank you. Actually, we have right next to, we, we just maybe pass the mic Hey, there. Frida. Hi. Yeah. How are you? Um, on behalf of this entire row, we just want to say that you're our hero. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure and you can find others. <laughs> And um, I guess I just want to ask, um, uh, was it hard to be like their employee and their fan? Because I feel like if we were in that office, there'd be no professionalism going down. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> no, I mean, I was the fan on the music side. Okay. Um, so when I was in the office, I, you know, I was working for Brian Epstein and for them as people. So... I mean, naturally, you know, when they came in the office, I was excited. But then it soon, that soon wore off, you know, when uh, 
I've asked them to do something and there'd be a moan or, you know, I think I've gone off him today. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, there was a difference, you know. Okay. Thank you. Oh, wait, Hi, they're passing you right down the road. But so, somewhat in line with that, how do you go from crazed, adoring fan to an employee slash family? Was it skills you possessed or professional skills no, you possessed? Or no, was I, it you know, I wasn't right a crazy thing? fan. You know, we, all the girls in Liverpool, we were, you know, we were just fans and we followed them around. But because they, were, they lived in Liverpool, they wandered around Liverpool themselves. You know, they were in and out of shops and, you know, somebody would say, oh, Paul's in George Henry Lee's buying his cigarettes. And then one of them would go in and say, hey, where are you playing tonight, Paul? And, you know, so there, there wasn't a the craziness in the early days. You know, nobody, like, went hysterical when they saw the Beatle. Well, you know... We, we think of, you know, crazy Beatle fans here, people who, you know, see, know, let's say they see Paul every place he goes, every concert. Um, there's, a, there's a number you drop in this film that, that had me on the floor uh, when you talked about how many times you estimated you saw the Beatles perform at the Cavern Club. Would you like to share that number yeah, with some folks yeah. here? Yeah, <laughs> I saw them probably nearly 200 times. Okay. Yeah. Okay, show of hands. How many people here got to see the Beatles 200 times? No, I didn't think so. Okay, um, but that's <laughs> that's what we think of. Um, we actually have someone in the front. Okay. Hi, Frida Ryan. Hi. Thank, great movie. I, I saw it Thank last you. night. You guys did a great job. Uh, uh, Frida, when you work, uh, when uh, the Beatles organization became Apple, did you have any dealings with Alan Klein? Uh, yeah, because I was still there when Alan Klein um, came in. You know, but. Um, I left soon after, you know. Well, um, I was very lucky, you know, I wasn't in working in London at the time, because I'll tell you now, I probably would have been sacked uh, because this particular day, because there were so many Americans used to go in the press office. I wasn't phased when I, um, if I rang and an American answered the phone. Um, and. I shouldn't really be telling you this, but anyway. I, I rang up this day, and this American answered the phone, and I s just said, you know, can you, can you put me through to Peter? And I mean, who is this? And I went, no, can you just put me through to Peter or Nell, you know? And he got really ratty with me, you know, and he went, who is this? And I said, never mind who it is, who are you? And he went, Alan Klein. I went, oh, just put me through to Peter. <laughs> well, I don't, oh, Christ, he's going to ask who that was, and then like, get her out. Well... <laughs> Um, yeah, we talked about uh, you know Apple. Like I said, there's been so many books and and um, you know and movie projects. People that were there. Um, do you, in between your the many other things in your life, your grandchildren and everything, over the years, did you keep pace with? Uh, if let's say one of those people, like Peter, wrote a book, did you make it a point to read it, or did you consciously stay away? Or um, Peter did ri ring me up and asked me, you know, would I help with it? Um, because I wasn't living in Liverpool at the time. I lived on the Wirral, and his parents, pieces from a place called Bebbington on the Wirral, and he said he was coming up to see his parents, and could he come and see me? But he told me that the book wasn't going to be about the Beatles. He told me it was going to be about the music of the 60s. Now, because I was extremely close to Peter, you know, I'd known Peter way back from Nems, uh, where I didn't do interviews or talk to people that wrote books, I would definitely have done it for Peter. But lucky enough, when he was coming up, I always went back to Ireland in, in August, and it just happened to be in August. Um, for those, so um, when the book came out, I was so glad I didn't talk. Yeah, for those um, who might not be familiar, Peter Brown was a Beatles associate and actually mentioned in the ballad of John and Yoko, he was John's best man. But an example of the, what I would call the anti Frida, someone who, you know, who did, uh, you know, decide to take the low road in a book. Yeah, but I um, was extremely surprised about that. Yeah. I never, ever thought Peter would do that. A lot of people uh, said that, including the surviving Beatles at the time. Uh, we're, you know, we're, and it, it takes a lot for them to be outspoken about uh, about something like that. Uh, they typically would just not give it any any attention that it that it doesn't deserve. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, we have here and the back and the front. We got a bunch. Good. Hi, Frida. Hi. Just a quick question. Could you just tell us about the last time that you met John and George? 
Wow. Uh, the last time I met George, God. I can't remember. Probably the day I left. No, I think I saw him afterwards. Um, John, way before that. Probably, you know, in Apple. I can't remember the year or the date. Okay. We have uh, we had another one in the front here, and I, we have a gentleman in the back as well. Um, and a lady in the front as well. Okay. Hi, Frida. Hi. Um, this is a little piece of trivia, but I remember in the Beatles monthlies, there was always a fan club letter. And I believe they were signed by you and Bettina and Ann Collingham. Um, who wrote those, those fan club letters? Was that a Tony Barrow? No, Tony uh, Barrow started it off. Okay. And then I done my little bit and the, the other two girls, because there's no Ann Collingham, that was right. a made up name. Um, there was a girl called Mary that they put her forward to be Anne Collingham, but she didn't, I think she only worked in the press office for about a year. Bettina Rose um, stayed even shorter. And then eventually it was just me. But I wrote all, you know, I gave all the snippets to Tony because I would see the, the lads, you know, in Liverpool and also the parents. I got a lot of information from the parents. Okay, great. Um, I think we had a gentleman around the back. We got, okay, there you go. Hi, Frida. Uh, Hi. Two quick questions for you. Did you travel at all with the group to maybe to America, to the craziness here, or Australia? No, no. Um, the only way I traveled with them really was Magical Mystery Tour. Yeah. So you were back in, you were back in I, Liverpool. I, I was, yeah, I was in, in the, the office. office. Yeah. And secondly, since you worked for Brian, just taking the focus off the Beatles for yeah. a moment, uh, was there any other group in his stable? He had some terrific groups in 62 and 3 and leading up in 64 uh, that you liked very much. I mean, just taking the spotlight off the Beatles for a moment, uh, one that you thought was really great. I liked the foremost. Foremost. And the reason why I liked the foremost, there was the humor. You know, they just didn't sing. They also done comedy sketches and everything. So were, you, were you involved with scheduling for Billy J. Kramer and Jerry yeah, and the Pacemakers? Yeah, and all well, that as Brian well. Epstein, he managed the Beatles, Jerry and the Pacemakers, the Foremost, Billy J. Kramer and the Dakota, with the Dakotas, um, Silla Black, Tommy Quickly. So I'd done all the wages for all of them. Yeah. You know, I typed all their wages and all the contracts and any letters, you know, that Epi needed doing, I'd done. That's great. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, at the Festival Beatle fans uh, last month in Chicago, it was a brief reunion. Billy J. Kramer was one of the special guests, and uh, I had the pleasure of hosting Frida and Billy on a panel about Liverpool humor, and it was like old home week. Uh, and I remember Frida saying, I used to do your pay packet. <laughs> um, so it was kind of... Yeah, he he reckons I owe him some money. It was one, <laughs> yeah, one packet I didn't give there him. There you go. <laughs> uh, we had another question up front. Hi, Frida. Hi. Hi, we love you. Thank you. Um, my question is, in the film, I saw you crawling up into the attic, mm. boxes and boxes of all this... Oh, no, there's only four Beatles stuff. All the rest is Christmas decorations. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought it was all Beatles. And my, and my daughter's school books. <laughs> <laughs> I just wondered if you were approached or if you thought about archiving it or putting it in a museum or anything like that. Great question. I really need to sort it out because after this lot had finished with me, I just threw it back in the box. So it's all mixed up and everything. But um, I'm going to give it put in my cousins. I think that's why Ryan didn't ask me to help with the film, because I'd have been up in the attic the whole time going through <laughs> those boxes. Uh, for those of you who, who haven't seen the film, I don't want to spoil it, but let's just say uh, if you've ever been looking through a flea market or at a Beatle Fest or in a record store going through looking for uh, some treasures on the Beatles, uh, you, the eyes are going to bug out of your head when you see uh, what's up, the, up there in the attic. Uh, we had time for one more question, and I think right on the end there, Hi, Frida. Hi. We haven't, I haven't had a chance to see the film yet, and I'm looking forward to it. But as, uh, as the Beatles' popularity was growing, was there any one moment where you said, oh, my God, this is going to be incredibly large and a yeah. cultural change? Their event? fame um, in the beginning didn't really hit me, nor them. Um, but it did hit me at the town hall in Liverpool because Liverpool decided gave them a civic reception and I got invited to that and uh, 
the Lord Mayor, you know, brought them out onto the balcony. And when they opened the doors to walk out onto the balcony, the noise from the crowd hit me. Now, you know, I wasn't asked to go out on the balcony because it was just the four Beatles. But I did go around the side and looked out. And I just couldn't believe the amount of people in Liverpool. Um, there was about two, you know, I don't... Somebody said 200,000 people were out there and I couldn't visualise that. But that's when it hit me how big they were, that their own city was turning out to see them. And... Um, it was a bit emotional for me, and I'm sure it was emotional for the parents, just to see that all these people love their sons, you know. You know, the Liverpool reception, as you'll see in the movie, is just one of many uh, events that uh, Frida was in with the Beatles, where uh, she got to go to as if, you know, seeing them every day in the office wasn't enough. Uh, she would get to go to shows and other, other events with them and the Magical Mystery Tour film and um, all kinds of other great stuff that, that's covered in this wonderful movie. It's called Good Old Frida. It opens up, uh, it'll be tomorrow on iTunes. It'll be available for rent on iTunes. And next week, it'll be showing at the Sunshine Cinema on Houston Street. And tomorrow, I think, is the, the gala public premiere right in Los Angeles, is that right? It's it a one. It opens tomorrow in Los Angeles, but also on iTunes. So iTunes is where you can right see it tomorrow, and our podcast will be in a couple days on iTunes. Great. If you want to relive uh, all Frida's uh, great stories again, we thank you all for coming here to the iTunes Theater. Frida, it was such a pleasure to have you.